Hello everyone and welcome to Arirang News. Live from Seoul, I'm Na Hyun Gyung. The stories we are following at this hour. Leaders from ASEAN and Korea are in Busan talking about enhancing ties on the political, economic and security fronts in the region. President Park calls for further utilizing the Korea ASEAN FTA. Korean Air CEO Cho Yang Ho apologizes for his daughter's actions. The very person who started all this, Cho's eldest daughter Cho Yeon will face prosecutors questioning today. And the directors of the CIA hold a rare press conference and says the enhanced interrogation techniques used by agents were indeed effective in obtaining useful information. So we begin in Korea's southern port city of Busan. We are into the second and final day of the Korea ASEAN Commemorative Summit. Arirang's Hwang Sung Hee is there covering the event for us. Sung Hee, good to see you. What's the latest? Hyangyang, the two rounds of the multilateral summit have ended. President Park Geun-hye will hold a joint press conference with current chair of ASEAN, Myanmar President Dane Sein. In just about an hour, they will provide a joint statement outlining the vision of their strategic partnership between Korea and ASEAN. Now, earlier in the day, President Park also proposed ways to bolster their two-way uh, cooperation. To name some examples, she again called for additional negotiations on further liberalization of the Korea ASEAN Free Trade Agreement. Now, this is something she touched upon yesterday at the Korea ASEAN CEO Summit. President Park also urged the two partners to expand their political and security cooperation, building on their first ever security dialogue that took place in June. She also vowed to share South Korea's development experience with the region by inviting people from ASEAN countries to share their knowledge in agriculture development as well as the science and technology sector. Now, Hyung as I mentioned, we're now less than an hour away from the joint press conference, and this will wrap up the two day summit. Back to you. All right, thank you, Sungi, for that update. And we will be bringing you live coverage of that joint press conference later, about in less than an hour, actually. And since yesterday, President Park has been holding one on one meetings with the visiting leaders of ASEAN, as we all know. For details on what was discussed during those meetings, here's our Che Yusan. After concluding an FTA with Vietnam, the Korean president secured a positive response from her Indonesian counterpart Thursday when she suggested they resume their FTA negotiations. Such bilateral deals are expected to increase the number of Korean firms that can benefit from free trade with ASEAN. As for investments in the region, the Thai Prime Minister promised to allow a Korean company retain priority when Bangkok selects a bidder for part of its $10 billion river management project. President Bak first raised the issue to the Thai leader last month after the new government in Bangkok said it would reconsider giving Korea priority. Winning infrastructure construction bids has become a major deal for Korean firms, with the ASEAN closely trailing the Middle East in terms of market size. On regional security, ASEAN leaders were united in voicing concerns about the threat of Pyongyang's nuclear weapons development to world peace and endorsed President Bak's efforts to denuclearize the peninsula by way of inter-Korean trust building and non-political cooperation. South Korea, as an aid recipient turned donor nation, pledged to expand development assistance to Laos and customize Korea's Hemaul Undong or modernization of rural communities to meet the needs of the Southeast Asian country. In addition, Seoul vowed to soon assist the Philippines with recovery efforts in the aftermath of a typhoon in the country which claimed dozens of lives. Following a marathon of talks, President Buck hosted her ASEAN counterparts and first ladies at a banquet that fused a tradition and modernity representing both Korea and ASEAN. Having reaffirmed their will to boost their cooperative ties, the 11 leaders will meet on Friday to discuss a range of regional and global issues. Choi Yusan, Arirang News, Busan.
awarded in the year 2012 for Korea was added to record high. All of the day's important events, events close to home and around the world. Join Na Hyung Young, live from Seoul. Shopping market thinks the true meaning of creation shines through. South Korea's unification minister, who's on a trip to Washington, stresses to reporters that Seoul's plan is to peacefully reunite the two Koreas and not to absorb Pyongyang. For more, here's Park ji -won. Speaking to reporters in Washington Thursday, South Korea's unification minister Liu Gilje said, strained inter-Korean relations in the long term are not beneficial to either side, and the time to change things for the better is now. Next year will mark the 70th anniversary of the nation's liberation from Japan, and it's time to make a breakthrough in inter-Korean relations. The minister said President Park Geun-hye's envisioned unification drive is based on the North and South working and growing together. He stressed that South Korea's push to unify the two Koreas is not an attempt to absorb the North. Earlier this year, the South Korean president said unification would be a bonanza for the two Koreas. But North Korea denounced President Park's drive, saying she wants to absorb the North into the South. I once again want to reiterate that our government's envisioned drive is a peaceful unification, not an absorption plan. However, Minister Liu said South Korea cannot turn a blind eye to North Korea's nuclear ambitions and human rights issues. So efforts to solve those issues will go hand in hand with Seoul's drive to improve inter-Korean relations. During his stop in the U.S. Capitol, the South Korean minister met with various U.S. officials, including chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Ed Royce, where he explained South Korea's unification policies and asked for their support. Park ji -won, Arirang News. The CEO of Korean Air, also the chairman of Hanjin Group, Cho Yang-ho, has apologized for his daughter's actions on a flight from New York to Korea. Now, many would know that as the nut rage incident. Cho Yang-ho will appear before the prosecution later in the afternoon to answer some tough questions. Here's Kim Min-ji for this report. Appearing at a press conference Friday afternoon, Cho Yang-ho, the chairman of Korean Air, apologized repeatedly on behalf of his daughter, who was scheduled to appear before aviation safety inspectors later today. Cho hyun ah now the former vice president of the airline, initially refused to show, but changed her mind after prosecutors raided the headquarters of the nation's flagship carrier over concerns of evidence tampering. Prosecutors have also barred her from leaving the country. Joe will be questioned about whether she used abusive language and why she forced a flight she was on to return to the gate to deplane a crew member. It is important that the airliner cooperate sincerely with the investigation, and we ask that passengers who are on board voluntarily appear for questioning. Joe was thrust into the international spotlight about a week ago after making a Korean air flight from New York to Seoul turn back to the gate when a flight attendant served her nuts in the package instead of on a plate apparently not following protocol. The government is currently investigating whether our actions broke air traffic safety laws or any regulations. The 40-year-old, the eldest daughter of Korean Air Chairman Cho Yang-ho, first stepped down from her duties related to flight services over the backlash, but later offered her full resignation. Cho will also quit her positions at affiliates of Korean Air, but is expected to maintain the shares she currently holds. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. Private institutions in Seoul forecast that the Korean economy will expand by 3.7 percent next year. This is the median of for 17 private research institutes. They also believe that growth will be slower than that projection in the first half of 2015. The forecast from foreign investment banks is lower at 3.6 percent next year, citing the weak Japanese yen's effect on Korean exports and weak consumer sentiment. All are lower than the 4 percent goal set by the government, by the Korean government, and the 3.9 percent set by the central bank. Now, the smartphone market has been saturated for quite some time now, but the aftermarket for smartphones is still a booming industry, at least here in Korea. Arirangza Shin Se-min reports. 
virtually everyone has one. These little smartphones that allow us to be connected and to connect. With up to 1.4 billion smartphones having been sold worldwide, it has created another ecosystem that is expanding quite rapidly. From portable rechargers charging the device practically anywhere, to Bluetooth handsets for hands-free phone calls, and smartphone-friendly gloves that allow users to text with gloves in the cold. These are just a handful of the products driving the smartphone accessory aftermarket. I use a sturdy and fashionable case to help protect my phone, but I'm here to check out some other products, including the Bluetooth-related devices. This Bluetooth speaker is just one of the products driving the smartphone accessory aftermarket. With just a few taps, the device is hooked up and you're ready to go. According to U.S.-based ABI research, the global smartphone accessory aftermarket is estimated to be worth more than 50 billion U.S. dollars by the end of this year. The market for these accessories is increasing despite smartphone shipments dipping as the market reaches maturity. Growth in the smartphone market is forecast to edge down over the next few years to just 6% in 2018. An industry watcher says that while smartphone sales are going one way, the accessory market is on the up and up. It's not rocket science. Technology is being applied to things we already use. It's not really technical, so they can be created by individuals, and this diversifies the market. While the analysts think camera-related products and accessories have the biggest room for growth, he says that's just a matter of how big the market will become. Even the industry's biggest players like Samsung and LG Electronics are hoping these kind of innovations will boost their profits even as the smartphone market slows. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. In the United States, it's not every day that you see the director of the CIA hold a press conference, but the mounting criticism against the agency regarding its past interrogation techniques has moved him. The chief recognized some tactics were beyond authorization, but generally defended what he calls not torture, but enhanced interrogation techniques. Connie Lee has more. The director of the CIA defended his agency in a rare TV press conference on Thursday. The detention and interrogation program produced useful intelligence that helped the United States thwart attack plans, capture terrorists, and save lives. According to John Brennan, that includes useful information that led to the death of Osama bin Laden. However, on the question of whether some of that information was obtained without the use of brutal torture sessions or enhanced interrogation techniques, otherwise known as EITs, Brennan said that was unknowable. Let me be clear. We have not concluded that it was the use of EITs within that program that allowed us to obtain useful information from detainees subjected to them. The director's statements come just two days after the U.S. Senate released a report that said the CIA acted more brutally in its torture techniques of detainees after the 9-11 attacks than it previously acknowledged. Some of the brutal methods described in the report were waterboarding, severe beatings, and a method that led to one detainee to freeze to death. Although the CIA chief said the majority of his agents followed legal advice, he did admit that some actions were not authorized. In a limited number of cases, agency officers used interrogation techniques that had not been authorized, were abhorrent, and rightly should be repudiated by all. One U.S. lawmaker has called for Brennan to quit, while the United Nations and human rights groups are asking for the prosecution of U.S. officials involved in the CIA program from 2001 to 2007. Connie Lee, Arirang News. Traffic is flowing again where tents once stood in Hong Kong. Local police made good on their promise Thursday to clear out the main protest site in Admiralty, marking an end to at least this chapter of the pro-democracy sit-ins. Some 7,000 officers were deployed to remove barricades and sweep up tents and other debris left behind. And now they were met with resistance, though about 200 people were arrested for obstruction and unlawful assembly. Among the detained were student leader Nathan 
in Law and Media Tycoon Jimmy Lai. Demonstrators vowed to continue their protest through other forms of civil disobedience, recognizing that it would be a long road to win their demands for free elections in the territory's leadership polls in 2017. Switzerland is halting an Ebola vaccine trial after a number of participants complained of side effects. The University of Geneva Hospital says four of their 59 test volunteers had mild joint pain in their hands and feet. Swiss researchers will stop administering the vaccine next week to find out what may have caused the issues. They also said they will work with other who are others who are testing the vaccine in the United States, Canada and Germany. Now, the Ebola virus has killed more than 6,000 people in West Africa since early this year. The U.S. has developed a new laser gun that could change the way battles are fought and won. The system is currently being tested on a U.S. Navy ship and the plans call for full deployment by the year 2020. Kim Hyun-bin has the story. Target. Locked and loaded. The U.S. Navy's newly developed laser weapon demolishes an enemy target at sea in a training exercise. This time, it locks onto an enemy drone and fires a 30-kilowatt laser. In just two seconds, the UAV is taken down. The laser weapon was recently deployed on the USS Ponce in the Persian Gulf for a four-month test run, and the results, officials say, were phenomenal is lifting hopes of a new type of defense against cheap anti-ship arms. The Office of Naval Research says the $40 million laser weapon is the first directed energy weapon system in history. Rear Admiral Matthew Clunder says it is fully operational on the USS Ponce and is used daily in training drills. The deployment of the weapon comes as the Pentagon is worried about losing its technological edge that enabled the U.S. to stay one step ahead of its rivals on the battlefield for decades. Many countries such as China and Iran have developed long-range missiles and accurate anti-ship missiles in recent years. The Navy plans to enhance the power of the laser system to 150 kilowatts, which would theoretically give them the capability to destroy a multi-million dollar missile for about a dollar. That more powerful laser is currently in development and is expected to be deployed by 2017. If proven effective, it could be widely produced and integrated on numerous ships. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. One of the biggest news updates this week in the local industry has been the casting of Park chang nooks new film, Fingersmith. That will be his return to the local industry after making Hollywood film Stoker. For more on this, we are now joined by Jason Bechervais in the studio. Good to see you again, Jason. Yeah, good to see you. Great to be here. Okay, so do tell us about director Park chang nook and his new uh, film. Yeah, Park chang nook of course, is one of Korea's most renowned uh, and prolific filmmakers. Mm -hmm. Old boy, of course, Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance, Lady Vengeance Thirst. He's made some very, very good films. And uh, his last film, Stoker, was his first kind of Hollywood film. Mm -hmm. It was received fairly well. It was released last year, starring you Nicole Kidman. Now, he, he's involved in a couple day. of projects, but uh, news this week was about his latest Korean movie, which um, I'm very interested in personally, and many others are as well. And we're seeing the cast. We, we did hear about the casting of Hajungo a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. uh, but that sparked a lot of curiosity as to who would play the female leads um, in his new film. Fingersmith, um, in the Korean title is Agashi, okay. um, roughly translates as young lady. Okay, so we will get to the female cast later shortly, but uh, you did say that the Fingersmith is referring to uh, an English novel it's, that it's based on. Yeah, it's, uh, it's based on a British novel. 2002 is written by Sarah Walters, uh, Fingersmith, uh, based, uh, well, the, the story takes place in Victorian uh, London huh. um, and follows two pickpocketers, otherwise known as Fingersmiths. Um, and uh, now Park is a 
adapted this movie into a different period and a different uh, location. It's going to take place during the colonial period and it's going to centre on two men and two women. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you did say that the female leads were mm -hmm. announced earlier in the weekend. That was kind of huge in the local industry. Yeah, really, really interesting. Right, we've got one uh, big actress, uh, Kim Min Hee. Um, she uh, is a big name in Korean cinema. Uh, she's been in a few films, Helpless, A Very Ordinary Couple, two um, great roles she played in there and when she gets the right script she can really uh, do something quite special right. um, and she's playing uh, one of the female female leads she's gonna play a heiress uh, mm. with a fortune um, and now what's more interesting is the casting of the other female lead Kim Teddy who is Kim Teddy? Kim Teddy. Yeah, she is a rookie. She's not acted in a film before. She, apparently, she's been. Uh, she started um, doing some work in some adverts or advertisements mm. um, on TV. She was born in 1990. Some pictures have circulated uh, on the web uh, following the news, and so um, it's interesting that he has cast an unknown. Mm. And it's not the first time that he's done this, actually, right? No. When, when he did cast for uh, old boy Kang Hye Jung. Was also pretty unknown in the in the industry. Yeah, exactly. It's not the first time that he's cast uh, an unknown actress. Um, uh, he's he's done it before. Kim Ok Bin is uh, is a good example. From right, first. she became huge too after that. Movie. Yeah, she she'd been in a couple of she'd been in films before, right. but um, there were smaller roles. This is a big role for her, and she's been a big actress ever since. And uh, Kang Ye. Kang Hye-jong as well is, uh, is, another, is another example from Old Boy as well. So she really came through mm -hmm. um, following her role in that film. Mm -hmm. So when can we expect to see this um, new film by Park chan -wook? Well, shooting apparently begins early next year. So I've, heard, I've read reports early next year. I've read reports that say May. Um, I think a three-month shoot is planned. So early to mid next year. Um, I suspect we'll see it probably either at the end of 2015 or 2016. Huh. Now, Park chan -wook, um does have a great um, history and a reputation at screening films. It was his, well, his films being screened at festivals, Cannes and Berlin, in right. particular. Mm -hmm. In particular, so um, we could see the film uh, get screened in Cannes, maybe in 2016 or Berlin. Who knows? It's still in the early stages, but I suspect it will premiere at a big festival. Okay, so let's say that his film is going to be released next year. So, what are some of who are some of the or which are some of the competitions that he's facing if it's going to be released well, next year? Well, Yu Sung Won, uh, a big kind of action man. Maverick director, The Berlin Fire was uh, a massive hit um, early last year. Mm -hmm. um, he's got his new film out called The Vet Veteran, starring mm -hmm. Hwang Jong Min. He plays the detective pursuing um, a young man uh, from a very wealthy family who run a conglomerate. I'm very interested about that film because um, it's, it sounds like it's really um, up, up his alley in terms of his, his key strengths. He's a very visual director. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also got uh, Na, Na Hong Jin, who uh, made The Chaser. Mm -hmm. um, his, his new movie is coming out. I think Gok Song is, is the Korean title. We don't have an English title just yet, just yet. Uh, but we will do soon. Um, and that movie apparently takes place in a village um, where a rumor takes place and there's an investigation. So details still very, very sketchy. Mm -hmm. But I'm very, 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 very curious to see that film. And it's being distributed and funded by 20th Century Fox, so oh, Hollywood movie, Hollywood right. studio funding Korean film. And they're also funding and uh, distributing Im Sang Soo. Im Sang Soo is a famous film director who made uh, The Housemaid, uh, The Taste of Money, and uh, some of his early films are very famous too. And his new film, My Friendly Villains, starring Yu Sung Won, the brother of Yu, uh, sorry, Yu Sung Bum, the brother of Yu Sung Won, the director I just mentioned. Right. So mm -hmm. um, I'm very curious to see that too. Okay, so we have a lot uh, going on and a uh, we'll, lot will come ahead of us for next year. Yeah, Exciting big year films. next year, big year with lots of film directors making films. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jason, for sharing your insights thank today. Thank you Hope for having me. Hope to see you me. soon again. <laughs>
It's currently minus 3 degrees here in Seoul. I'm Michelle Park here with the latest weather forecast. We started off the day at minus 7 degrees, which was roughly 6 degrees lower than yesterday. And temperatures are expected to uh, rise, but not much. Uh, there is cold wave advisory in effect over in Kaunda province, while other regions, including Seoul, will be getting um, some nationwide snow this afternoon. Now we are looking at heavy snowfall in the areas in the west of the peninsula, while the uh, other regions, including Seoul, will be getting between 1 to 3 centimeters starting this afternoon. And to our uh, reading, readings for today, so we'll peak to 1 this afternoon, and Gwangju and Busan will be peak, peaking up to 3 and 7. And to other regions, Jeju Island peaks to 8, Tokyo hits lower at 3, while Mount Kung be hitting low at minus 9 degrees. Well, that's all for now. I'm Michelle Park, and have a wonderful day. And that's Arirang News for now, but stay tuned. In about 30 minutes, there will be a live coverage of the press conference between President Park Geun-hye and Myanmar President Thein Sein down at the Korea ASEAN Summit in Busan. Thanks for watching.